Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're gonna to be talking about low FODMAP diets, kind of their purpose, and how I specifically use them in my practice clinically. All right, and before we dive in, make sure you smash that like button, really helps the algorithm here. Also, put your comments down below. Really wanna know what, your, what you think about uh, low FODMAP diets and or dealing with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Really appreciate the feedback. All right, so let's dive in. What's a low FODMAP diet? So first off, a FODMAP is fermentable oligo, disaccharide, mono, and polyols. These are fermentable carbohydrates and again, they're in a lot of healthy foods, right? There's a lot of cruciferous um, vegetables, whether it's um, whether it's cabbage, um, cauliflower, whether it's sauerkraut, whether it's fermentable foods like kombucha or pickles or kimchi, uh, onions, garlic, uh, broccoli, broccoli stalks for sure. These are going to be higher in these fermentable carbohydrates called FODMAPs. Some of these are good, really good foods that are nutrient dense, anti-inflammatory, low toxin, and on a good paleo template. So some people may be confused about like, well, why do I have to make these changes? Well, if you have something known as SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or just a generalized dysbiosis, we need a breath test to confirm SIBO for sure. And a lot of times my patients, they just come back with a lot of bad bacteria in their gut. One of the first things we'll do is if we see a lot of digestive issues, especially like a lot of motility problems, if we see a lot of um, constipation, bloating, gas, burping, any kind of chronic indigestion issue, one of the first things we're going to look at are our FODMAPs, fermentable carbohydrates. And when you consume these fermentable carbohydrates, if you have a lot of bad bacteria, these foods ferment in your gut and they produce various gases like hydrogen gas and methane gas. Some urea as well. There's some other urea breath testing that's out, but primarily hydrogen and methane. Hydrogen tends to predispose people for diarrhea, methane for constipation. You can alternate and even switch and you know be paradoxical, not be a traditional type of presentation. So when we have someone with SIBO, we want to actually starve out some of the critters. So when we deal with someone with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the the low FODMAP diet, and I do a paleo low FODMAP diet because there's a lot of low FODMAP diets out there that contain a lot of let's say not so nice paleo foods. You can have ones with rice and other types of grains and, and lentils that are in there that could be a problem. So we do a paleo low FODMAP and a lot of times I'll overlap that with an autoimmune template too because I see a lot of patients that are sensitive to autoimmune foods that may or may not be a problem with, um, with a low FODMAP diet, whether it's ghee or whether it's um, potato. Those are all potential low FODMAP foods but they, they aren't necessarily autoimmune. Same with rice too. So we'll typically start with one of those templates. The first goal of a low FODMAP diet is to starve out dysbiotic bad bacteria. So the bacteria is going to rely on two major fuel sources. It's going to rely on a lot of acellular carbohydrates and refined processed sugar foods. And some of those foods may be high FODMAP, some not, okay? And then the other would be just higher FODMAP foods, even healthier foods. And this is where it gets tough. That's why some people, they make their diet better and they improve it and they cut a lot, a lot of the processed crap, but they're like, hey, I'm still feeling not well. Why is that the case? And a lot of times FODMAPs could be a missing piece of the puzzle. So we'll starve critters out on the first side, right? We'll restrict a lot of the bad foods like we already talked about, but then also the FODMAP foods. Well, that kind of starves things out and really can start moving things in the right direction. On the back side, we'll look at more digestive support and actually addressing the infections. That's a totally different argument. So when we add in the FODMAPs, when we pull out the FODMAPs, when we add in that low FODMAP template, we can see a resolution in motility, in poor digestion, in bloating, in gas, in burping. We can see a big resolution sometimes off the bat within a couple of days to a couple of weeks. A lot of times people that have SIBO, that bad bacteria can feed back and create a low enzyme and low acid environment. So even if you, let's say, are on a low FODMAP diet, you probably wanna be adding in enough digestive support so we can break down protein, break down fats. And again, it's important if you're getting some success on a low FODMAP diet, you probably want to engage with a functional medicine practitioner so you can do some testing to figure out what's going on with the gut. Do you have an H. pylori infection? Is there just generalized SIBO bacteria like Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, Proteus, whatever, right? Or is there something deeper? You also want to make sure you work through my 6R program, right? So you're moving the bad foods, replacing enzymes and acids, repairing the gut lining and the hormones. That's very important. Fourth R, we go after infections, not first. Most people switch that up. Fifth R is going to be re-inoculate, repopulate healthy, good bacteria. Six R, we are retesting the gut to make sure things are clean. And 
I'll do some breath testing here or there if a comprehensive genetic stool test comes back without a lot of good information. And if I also run a, an organic acid test and that doesn't come back with any generalized bacteria overgrowth in the urine portion of the you know, of that test, right? There's a dysbiosis panel that looks at benzoate and hipparate and 2,3-phenylacetate. Uh, There's a lot of different bacteria, organic acids that can be helpful too. So if I see those are not coming back, well, we'll dive a little bit deeper in for sure. So FODMAPs can be very helpful. So we may look at for protein sources tend to never be a FODMAP problem. So high quality protein sources are good. On the vegetable sources, you know, you're looking at broccoli florets, maybe okay. Kale, spinach are going to be on the okay side. Um, on the berry side, typically strawberries, uh, blackberries, raspberries. Uh, uh, blackberries are actually a no-go. So blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries are good. Blackberries a no-go. Um, there's an excellent app you can get. It's called Low FODMAP A to Z. It's in your app store. And that's a really good one to kind of get a little bit more nuanced of w which foods are better or which foods are worse. I have a handout that's a low FODMAP handout. We'll try to put that link down below. I think I did a good podcast and a uh, article on this topic. So I'll give you a more comprehensive list. But usually you have your proteins are fine. Your fats are fine with the exception of usually... Um, yeah, fats tend to be okay because there's not a lot of fermentables in fats, right? The big FODMAPs are going to be in your in your vegetables and your fruits and in your starches. Now, your good safe starches are going to be squash, sweet potatoes, a moderate one. Usually plantains are okay, cassava, yucca, parsnips, turnips, rutabagas, those are okay. Uh, white potatoes, if you can tolerate, um, if you're not on an autoimmune template and you can tolerate a paleo template, maybe white potatoes. And again, all steam, cooked, mashed, sauteed. And then on the vegetable side, usually spinach, usually kale, um, usually broccoli florets, the flower pot, not the stalk. Uh, usually a lot of your salad greens are okay. But if patient's digestion is bad, we may avoid all raw foods for a while because raw foods can be hard on the tummy and we'll typically steam or saute or cook a lot of those good quality vegetables. I think collard greens are also good too. Bok choy is also good too. And again, I have a comprehensive list that I give my patients that I created. And then I also have um, that app, the low FODMAP A to Z app that I'll use as a backup to provide extra support. So FODMAP can be a really important healing component when dealing with bacterial overgrowth. And it can be a really important component when there's a lot of chronic motility issues and gas issues and bloating issues. And it really helps start the starving, the starvation portion of the bug. So the three parts is, right, starvation, right, killing, and then crowding out. Starvation, kill, and then crowd out. So I have my six R's, right? And those three R's that I, I highlighted in regards to SIBO, they kind of overlap those six R's, if you will. So just to kind of make it a little bit easier when dealing with SIBO and FODMAPs, the SIBO portion, the FODMAP portion is the starve of the SIBO. The middle portion is the kill portion. That's the fourth R. And then the fifth R is going to be the Re, uh, re crowd out portion. So first R really is going to deal with the low FODMAP starve. Fourth R is the kill, right? That's the kill. And then the fifth R repopulate, re-inoculate, AKA crowd out. Starve, kill, crowd out. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I've, I've developed protocols over the years that systematically help me so I don't mess up or miss anything with my patients. It just allows me to be thorough and um, really go through you know, all my protocols with patients and not miss anything. And that helps me provide the highest level of care and results for my patients. So if you guys enjoyed the content, feel free, let me know down below. Really appreciate it. And if you want to reach out, links down below as well. If you want to reach out to myself and my colleagues, we're available worldwide for functional medicine support and help. All right. Today's a live video, so we'll go into some Q&A. Hope you guys enjoyed it. All right. So let's keep on rolling. I heard a chiropractor say sleeping between 10 and 2 a.m. is the most beneficial time for your health. Is that true? Yes, it is. And I may skip questions, y'all, if it's not pertinent to the topic on hand. So just FYI, if I skip it, it's not an accident. I was on an AIP diet and a low FODMAP diet. Do I reintroduce FODMAPs after six to eight weeks? And in the meantime, introduce non-AIP foods that are not higher FODMAPs. So it just depends. So this is a great question. So I'll typically add FODMAPs back in usually four to six weeks. I definitely want to be adding some FODMAPs back in and some more carbohydrates back in during the kill phase because that can bait out, act like cheese on the mousetrap for some of that bad bacteria. So 
Dr. Pimentel out of um, Cedar sinai he found that adding guar gum in actually enhanced the success on some of the antibiotic protocols they use for SIBO. So they would use like a lot of Zyfaxin or Rifaximin and then sometimes Neomycin, and they'd add a little bit of guar gum in to uh, act like cheese on the mousetrap, and they found the antimicrobials drugs in that standpoint worked better. Now, we think the theory is the same when we use the herbs as well. I like the herbs better. They are more selective. They don't have the efflux, pump, and inhibition problems. They tend to have a lot of antioxidants where antibiotics actually can have a lot of oxidative stress and mitochondrial stress too. So a lot of the herbs tend to have a lot of more nutrients as well, which can be very helpful. So I'll add back in FODMAPs during the kill phase, but it just depends on how bad a patient feels. If they really feel bad or there's a significant irritability with it, then we may dial that and that's where working with a clinician is so important. Jacob writes in Nut Duck, I increase the antimicrobial herbs, my scaly dry skin flares up. Is that more likely die off or allergy to the herb? It's hard to say. It depends upon how good your diet is and how much success you've had going into it. It could be either one, probably a die off issue. So I would just really work on titrating that in gently. Which is better for gut, cayenne pepper or ginger for general health? Well, in my ginger tea, you can add in cayenne pepper. I just don't because I don't love it. But the I think it's the capsin in there have some really good gut healing effects too. I just don't like the feel of it. Dr. J, could a gut dysbiosis cause weight gain after a month of sucralose abuse? Definitely could. The sucralose is splendor, right? That's a, 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 that's a, I think a sugar molecule attached to three chlorines, and that can have a negative impact on the microbiome. So it's very possible that a lot of the splenda use affected the gut microbiome, and that could easily, you know, cause some gas issues and some uh, bloating for sure. I hate the garlic smell, but I know it has benefits. Any alternatives? Well, it depends. I'm not a huge garlic fan. Garlic's very high in FODMAP too, by the way. But we'll actually use the active allicillin component on a kill phase with it. So it just depends. If you don't like it, don't eat it. I don't love garlic either. I follow the low FODMAP diet, but it's also helped me about 50%. What else can one do with the diet to have better results? Well, low FODMAP paleo is going to be the best way to go. And then also you may want to overlap with an AIP template. I tell my patients the goal is not to be on that diet forever. The goal is to be on some type of whole food paleo template with your adjusted macros that allow you to feel the best, maybe with an 80, 20, 90, 10 on the cheat side, right? That way you can enjoy life. You still feel great. You still have great energy. You cheat a little bit here and there. And ideally when you cheat, always try to mitigate the cheats, try to choose the healthiest cheat over a bad treat, right? Like cauliflower pizza is better than a pizza full of gluten and cheese, right? So just try to choose the better cheat. And if you have a good mouthfeel with it, meaning you enjoy how, the, how it tastes, that's even better. Okay, great. Is it better to be low carb or low fat with treating pancreatitis? We are not sure uh, the cause of the gallstones I have found so far. Any supplement to help? Yeah, go look at my podcast, my video on Monday. I went all into pancreatitis. Go look at that. That Everything in that video is going to be pertinent. And go look at my podcast on gallbladder. So you should be utilizing all that information. How to gain weight and get energy on a low FODMAP diet. Number one, make sure you eat enough calories. Number two, add in more safe starches, right? Squash. Sweet potato is a moderate one. You may be able to handle it. Maybe white potato. Turnips. Greener bananas, plantains, rutabagas, parsnips, those are all good options. But one, get enough calories. Two, get enough carbs. And you can use chronometer.com to assess that. Any recommendation for low FODMAP diet probiotics? So I'll typically add in, if patients are really sensitive and they can't handle your typically typical fermented foods or like my probioflora that has lactobacillus or acidophilus, we'll throw in Megaspore, which has more of the bacillus strains, which are very helpful because there's not a delactate production from that. Um, let's see here, it's a couple of questions. Does colloidal silver help get rid of gut bacteria? Yes, it can. Colloidal silver is great for biofilms as well, and biofilms protect a lot of the bacteria, and it, it tends to be very helpful against like antibiotic resistance. And I'll use the nano silver, not the colloidal silver, and I'll combine that a lot of times with good herbs, and it helps the herbs work better. Great questions. How much fiber do you recommend on a low FODMAP diet without having diarrhea? It just depends. I'll look at the low, lower FODMAP vegetables and we'll just see how much we can consume. One to two servings per meal is ideal. 
How many weeks is it safe to consume 120,000 IU or SPU of serpentinase? Not sure about what that equals in regards to capsules. Not sure. But enzymes are pretty safe. People use them for high doses for long periods of time for scar tissue, fibroids, tumors, everything. So it's probably safe as long as you're not getting diarrhea. Usually the side effect of too much enzymes is diarrhea. Is there a particular brand of ginger tea you recommend? I jumped in late, sorry. No, oh, no, I just do um, high quality organic ginger from your health food store, and then you can just juice that, and then you can use a French press or a coffee filter to, uh, to filter out the um, particulate of the fiber. And that's the best way, and then you can add in some honey and all that good stuff. Great, I just viewed your first video posted eight years ago on YouTube. Can we get Dr. Re Dr. Video, Dr. Reaction video also? Do you still stay in touch with your colleague, Barris Harvey? Oh, that's funny. Excellent. Yeah, eight years ago. I can't believe it. The time I'll have to do a reaction video of that. It's good. Um, I spoke with Barris a few months ago, but I'm not sure if he's in the health field as much. So I connected with Evan back in 2015, and we just kind of hit it off um, even a little bit better, and we were kind of more in sync, both being on the practitioner side. So yeah, Barris is a good guy, though. What do you think about the immunoglobulin as a supplement for restoring gut health? Yeah, so like I use one called Mega IgG2000, which is bovine IgG, IgA, IgM. That's helpful for gut permeability. It has some antibacterial effects. I think that is uh, excellent. Yeah, I'm seeing people do a lot more of these doctor or the kind of reaction videos where they watch a video and react. I'll have to start doing that more. That's a really good idea. Appreciate that. All right, any other questions here on Facebook? Let me see. Oh, here's Holly. I see a lot of ACV subs in capsule form now. Are they a waste of money? Seem like taking it directly from the bottle is best. Oh, so here's the deal on that, Holly. So ACV is acetic acid, right? I think if you can do it, B10 HCL is the best, right? Because you can get it up to a higher therapeutic level. The only reason why you would want to do it in a capsule form is because you hate the taste of apple cider vinegar. It makes you sick, and you just want to get it down easier. That's the only reason why you'd want to do it in capsule form. Once you go above a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, you're better off just going to HCL in a capsule form because it's more therapeutic. And then a lot of times you get pepsin with it, right? Usually good HCL has pepsin with it. So ACV is like the training wheels for digestive support. And I'll use it starting off with people that have like a raw gut mucosa because if they can tolerate ACV drink before a meal, then that kind of tells me their gut's in good enough condition to go to HCL capsules with food in the in your tummy first. So if someone's coming from a gastritis or an ulcer history, we'll kind of get them cleared up, just use enzymes, kind of get things more stable, and then we'll kind of prime things and kind of test things with some ACV. And if we get irritation or any type of inflammation in the tummy with the ACV, then that tells me we're probably not ready yet. Great question though, but probably not necessary unless you really love apple cider vinegar and you wanna use it, but don't like the taste. I'm only recommendation on that. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate the compliments. I have poor motility. Which foods will aid? So low FODMAP paleo will be a good first start. Excellent. Can you please give advice on situations where there's a, uh, a burnish feeling one to three hours after a meal, right? When food goes down into the small intestine, it seems like I feel better with glutamine somehow. Yeah. So glutamine will definitely help calm down the gut lining. It helps provide building blocks for the enterocytes in the gut. There's probably either one inflammatory foods that aren't good, or you need more stomach acid and enzymes, or there could be a bug too. It's either going to be poor food, poor digestion, right? So don't hydrate with food um, outside of a couple ounces for some pills. Make sure you, make sure you uh, di dial in enzyme and acid production. And you may have to look at Assessing gut function in regards to stool testing, maybe an H. pylori infection, maybe SIBO, maybe a parasite. Could be any of those. All right, excellent, y'all. Very good questions, guys. Really appreciate it. I'm going to sign out here. I'll be back later on this week, probably tomorrow, for another video. And I really appreciate the engagement. Feel free and share this with friends or family. And then click down the links below for more support. Let me just ask one more video, one more question here. Susan writes in, love your videos. Thank you so much from British Columbia. Thank you so much for the feedback on that, Susan. Really appreciate it, y'all. All right, guys, have an awesome day. Take care. Bye.